somehow works out of the box. Uh, sorry for being the last talk today. Um, I'm Joris Kramwinkel. I uh, worked for Artec Finance for over 10 years. Today is a special day for me because I just turned 34. I have no pictures of my hobbies because I have no time. <laughs> I have four sons also. So I have to make fun at work, which I'm uh, gladly to, to present today. Um, Artec Finance is a 40 year old, what you now would call a fintech company. It's a Dutch company. We operate uh, globally. We're helping uh, over 14 trillion euros in assets in, in making financial investment decisions. We serve our customers globally with a lot of number crunching uh, workloads. And for the past two years, I've been responsible for our cloud native transformation as a company. And since I have a background in HPC myself, I really liked. Uh... Okay. I will I, I'll freeze. <laughs> I really liked onboarding our HPC workloads. And uh, last year I was in Valencia to, to, uh, for inspiration. I'm very excited to share uh, as a speaker now uh, our journey so far. So a bit of uh, context. Um, we decided to do managed over do-it-yourself. So that's why managed Kubernetes. Uh, we have different flavors, uh, of course. Uh, in the context of this talk, it's about managed OpenShift in both uh, AWS and, and Azure. Um, so the de decommissioning of our on-prem data centers was a fact. Uh, big challenge to, to, to move our HPC operations to this managed Kubernetes environment. Next, that it needs to be managed. We wanted also to, to perform well, at least at par as our bare metal. We wanted to scale not only up, but also down. Our workloads are very peaky in the financial industry, uh, beginning of the quarter, end of the year. These are moments that our client needs thousands of CPUs and the rest of the time they don't need it. And they don't want to pay for it also. Concurrency, uh, a lot of talks today are, are about scheduling. Uh, yeah, we try to get rid of the scheduling problem as a whole. We want uh, a hassle-free multi-tenancy. I will explain that uh, later. Vendor independence is also very important. Although we use managed Kubernetes, we don't want to, man uh, to marry a hyperscaler. Also, we don't want to attach ourselves to one specific Kubernetes distribution. So we want a Kubernetes native solutions to run our APC operations on. So hi over, how does it look like? What's under the new, on the hood? Which hyperscaler you use? We don't, uh, we don't care. We want Kubernetes and on top of that, we selected uh, like Lego bricks. We assembled our framework with very, very battle-tested uh, open source projects. Prometheus, Keda, Key Native, and as a queuing system, we use the open source ActiveMQ. Um, so these are all packaged in YAMLs. So how to configure them for our framework is a few hundred lines of uh, YAMLs. We, we package them with customized Argo CD ready in a uh, repository I'll share later. On top of that, uh, we also templated how you should define your jobs and your, and your tasks. These are just 300 lines of, of C Sharp. So that's truly our contribution. It's really about how it, the, it interfaces with the rest under the hood. It is in .NET, but you can easily uh, do it in Python as well. Uh, so this is a very lean uh, 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 setup. And our context is, so in, in our pods, it can be thousand slides of, of, of Python that's uh, it's running, but we also have fat pods, like 600,000 lines of, of, of C Sharp in one container. It's all one process per container context. So how does it look like? So from left to right, uh, our users interact via REST API, which is keen, uh, which is, uh, provisioned by uh, key native, it's, it's serverless. It, the HTTP traffic triggers, awakes the API. The API is responsible for putting a job on the job queue. Keda sees the job coming in the queue and, and creates a Keda skill job. And that's nice that it's in the queue because if somehow the job is killed or, or terminated, as long as it's not acknowledged on the queue, it will reboot the job. So it's very resilient in nature. The job is responsible for putting tasks on the queue, which allows us also to, to do uh, DAC workloads. 
if tasks are put on the queue, Keda knows how many pulls it wants uh, uh, to compute. And these task runners are actually very stupid things. They just fetch from the queue, execute, acknowledge the task, and repeat until the queue is empty. So we have a termination of X seconds for after the queue is empty. And then these uh, task runners will terminate themselves and scale back to zero. In fact, all elements here in the picture scale to zero, even the, the queuing mechanism. And this is not only uh, nice for cost perspective, uh, but also very nice in, in tenancy, in, in multi-tenancy context. I can make a namespace per user, I can make a namespace per application. Um, so, so far, uh, scaling pods. But the big question is, if we can scale pods, scaling pods is easy, but how, in a managed context, does the infrastructure scale along? So, in Kubernetes context, the cloud controller manager is responsible for this and depends a bit on the hyperscaler of its implementation. But uh, so some managed Kubernetes uh, providers have machine sets, node pools, they all have different names for it. But in essence, VMs are provisioned automatically based on pending, pending pods. And by means of tolerations and taints, we can provision many flavors of machine set with GPUs, without GPUs, Intel, AMD, uh, different uh, memory architectures, and also these machine sets scale back to zero, which is very interesting feature. So how does it work in practice? So this is nice in theory. So how does it work in practice? So this is kind of the conclusion on, on, on this question. Does this elasticity, elasticity promise of a cloud, can you monetize on that in HPC context? So these are empirical results, uh, but we were able to spin up 1,500 CPUs within 20 seconds up of the 20 minutes up and back to zero. We also were able to do this in spot instances on Azure, which is nice because this 20 minutes of 1,500 CPUs only costs us six euros, which is insanely cheap. It scales to zero, which is nice. Although I have to say, if you use these uh, open source projects, you want operators to be there which have controllers, so you pay the price of them. Uh, node provisioning is an interesting topic because it really relies on how fast your hyperscaler can provision these VMs. And we tested both on Azure and AWS. It's roughly four minutes for a node to come up, regardless the VM family and regardless the hour of the day. We thought, okay, maybe in business hours it's slower, but it's not the case. It, it, it's a bit volatile though. In order for this to work, you need a very good machine set or no pool implementation. It depends a bit on hyperscaler, how mature these are. Regarding downsides, yeah, these managed Kubernetes clusters come also with guardrails. So uh, sometimes they have a limited maximum amount of nodes you can hit at a certain point. And also with Azure, uh, we, we perceive that sometimes we get, we, we ask for a certain VM type and under the hood we get different hardware, newer generation hardware and that leads to, to unexpected results. I know in, in ABUS, this, this is more tightly coupled. So to conclude, where can you learn more? Uh, so we run this stuff in production uh, with our products. Um, we extracted kind of the bare minimum, put it in, into GitHub. I have a student now that's working on the Slurm interface, like this REST API part. You want uh, to talk with the, the Slurm language to it and, and see how you, uh, can offload your workload there. We want to track carbon footprint in the, in the uh, workloads we, uh, we run. And furthermore, uh, another colleague, colleague of mine uh, recorded the demo where you see this in, in, in real life, scaling from zero machines to many. That's the YouTube uh, QR code. Thank you all for listening. And uh, <laughs> hope you have a good conference.